did. Now, um, we want to welcome you to today's COSA webinar, um, Focus Storage on a Budget. And we just say that we are fortunate to have three presenters with us today who bring a wealth of knowledge of information to the table. And as a result, uh, we're going to be extending today's webinar by an extra 15 minutes. It will go uh, until 4.15 Eastern Time, um, and we hope that will then allow plenty of time for questions and audience interaction. I just want to take a bit of time to orient you to the screen. Uh, um, I'm many of you have not most of you have, have done a WebEx webinar. It's a little different from uh, the platform we had been using. Uh, you'll notice on your the right-hand side of your screen there, uh, at the mid-screen and at, at the lower part of the screen, there are two boxes, a chat box and a Q&A box. Chat for chatting, Q&A is for Q&A. But uh, feel free, if, if anything strikes you, strikes you, use whichever box you'd, you'd like to, to type into. And, um, I'll keep my eye on, on those boxes and passing along questions to our presenters. Um, if you uh, have a question, uh, type it in, or you can hit the little hand icon that's right above the chat box. That's the uh, hand, and we can call on you then as well. Um, so I want to our sponsor of this webinar, Gaylord Brothers. We're just delighted to be partnering with Gaylord on the content development for today's presentation, and we thank Gaylord for its support of COSA. Our for today are three very noble ladies, and they're listed in the order in which they're going to be speaking. Alice carver Cubic, Photograph Research Scientist at the Image Permanence Institute in Rochester, New York. And she's followed by Jen Foltz Cruikshank, who is the conservative of the Maryland State Archives, and Amanda Baker, Archival Product Manager, Archival Supplies at Gaylord Brothers, is going to be presenting last. And these uh, know an awful lot. I'm 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 awestruck um, with uh, with all the great information that they're going to have to share with us today. I'm going to be turning the webinar over to Alice, Alice carver Cubic, uh, who will uh, kick us off with an overview of our subject matter for today. Alice, welcome, and Thank take you. it away. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, as Ann said, I'll be giving an overview of photographic storage. Some topics I'll only just mention, as my colleagues will be going into more detail later on in the presentation. Also, my presentation will be posted. Uh, there's a lot more detailed information in the notes field of my PowerPoint. Um, I'll sort of be able to verbally say. So you can review the slide later with a little bit more information in there. Okay, so I just want to tell you a little bit about IPI if you're not familiar. Independent Institute is a nonprofit, UC based laboratory devoted to preservation research. It's the world's largest independent laboratory with this specific scope. We were founded in 1985 through the combined efforts and sponsorship of the Rochester Institute of Technology and the Society for Imaging Science and Technology. Our, our funding uh, for preservation research and outreach efforts come primarily from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. We need information consult services, practical tools, and preservation technology to libraries, archives, and museums worldwide. Imaging and consumer preservation industries also use our consulting services, our tech services, and our educational services. Um, photographic materials includes handling, proper environment, and proper materials. Modern light levels within your storage facility is also important and something to keep in mind. And I also want to mention, while this webinar focuses on storage, it's important to consider proper preparation for this display. Okay, let's first discuss photographs and how they deteriorate. Since the production of digital photography, the definition of, of, of a has become a little unclear. Traditionally, a photograph is an image 
on a kind of light-sensitive material, which is made permanent. Photograph based on the light sensitivity of our salts, also known as silver halides, iron salts, or um, salts of, of dichromate, that's chromium. The engineering substance may be a metal, like silver or platinum, that's known as them, a pigment or a dye. Digital photographic images are composed of dye or pigment. The image may be suspended in an organic binder, like gelatin, albumin, or collodion, or rest within the paper fibers of a paper support. Support material will uh, be paper, uh, acetate, cellulose nitrate, polyester, glass. But what here is a cross section of uh, a gelatin POP from the late 19th century. You can suppose of three layers. There's the paper support on the bottom. Well, there's something called a barita layer. At the top is a gelatin silver emulsion. The emulsion consists of, of silver image particles suspended in a gelatin binder. Some have two layers, some have one. This is a dry plate, so there's uh, the glass support with the silver emulsion on top. Uh, this is a really interesting. This is a Kodachrome print. This is a cross section of a Kodachrome print. So there's pigmented cellulose acetate uh, with three emulsion layers on top, each with a different colored dye suspended in it. Uh, that sounds kind of interesting. So I mean, photographs are made from a wide of materials, including plastics, papers, glass. Metals, pigments, dyes, organic substances like gelatin, collodion, and albumin. Each process deteriorates in a different way depending on the materials from which they're made. And uh, deterioration can be broken down into three types mechanical, chemical, biological. All three types of deterioration are caused in part by poor environment and poor quality storage materials. or physical deterioration of photographs is caused by excessive handling as well as poor storage environment. A significant amount of mechanical deterioration is due to improper handling. It can also contribute to mechanical damage. This can due to fluctuations in relative humidity, which causes the binder, particularly gelatin, to swell and shrink. Again, more information in the, in the slide notes. Uh, if you detail, there are just too many kinds of mechanical deterioration. Uh, one on the left is due to poor handling. The one on the right is primarily due to storage environment. Deterioration is low, for not noticeable. Chemical deterioration is caused by poor storage environment such as the relative humidity being too high or the temperature being too high. It's a poor quality storage materials, environmental pollutants in the air, exposure to light, and what's called inherent device, such as poor processing resulting in residual chemicals with a photograph or just the naming of the materials themselves. Cold deterioration is a result of a combination of several causes. Within photographs, chemical reactions are taking place as part of the natural aging of the materials. Excess heat and humidity feed up these reactions. Also, with poor quality storage materials, allows chemical pollutants to attack the silver image uh, if the image is silver, and in some cases can cause discoloration of the binder. So this is sort of the horror show of chemical deterioration, and this. This is just three kinds of the many, many, many forms of chemical deterioration. So um, the albumin print shows fading of the image, and uh, as well as yellowing of the of the albumin binder. The yellowing of the albumin binder is quite quite natural. It's, it's sort of naturally aging. Uh, in the center, you have chrom chromogenic color deterioration, fading, shifting color. We know that, that chromogenic color photographs fit in the light and the dark. Um, eventually, um, most photographs will sort of look like that. And, and then on the left is silver mirroring. Uh, silver mirroring can be caused by environmental pollutants in combination with high relative humidity, 
uh, so poor quality storage materials. Mold fungus can grow on pretty much anything, including daguerreotypes. Risk for mold typically starts at a relative humidity of 65% or higher. Mold especially likes organic binders, particularly gelatin, so it's common to find mold on albumin and collodion binders as well, and just on paper. Insects also feed on organic matter. Uh, it's a gelatin. Um, in insects also feed on mold. Uh, mold and insects thrive in conditions of elevated relative humidity. So the envelope is uh, an extreme case of mold, which eventually will solubilize the gelatin binder of this photograph. Uh, is an insect that I found trapped in an a amber type case. Uh, this happens to be a book louse, and um, book louse uh, feed on mold. Um, I imagine that within that amber type, there's also some mold happening. The mantra I learned in graduate school is purpose, contents, use, time, base, money. You'll be familiar with these ideas, and know that this is a balancing act worthy of the Ringling Brothers. But your intuition, your education, your training, and experience to advocate for your collection and do what's best resources you have. Also, grants. I'll be mentioning grants a lot here. Collections management is the easiest and most cost-effective way to improve preservation quality. This is a given, uh, but it's nice to review once in a while. Regional collection policy defines the purpose and significance of your collection and will give you guidance in preservation goals and priorities. The all caring equally for all collections and materials and the reality are not the same. So what's in your collection and the condition in which your collection materials are in or you can be care for it. Having dogging records and finding it will minimize handling and therefore minimize deterioration. A source called Graphics Atlas is produced uh, by Image Permanence Institute. Um, this is this is my project directly. It's a sophisticated resource that is a unique object-based approach for identification and characterization of print photographs. Pro identification is a challenge. Uh, it's like I said, it's essential to know what you have in order to properly care for your collection. And this resource can take some of the mystery out of cross identification. And I really believe in it. And I really do think it's a good resource. So I, I highly recommend and then checking it out. We also have an email blast called Interesting Picture of the Week that you can sign up for through the website. It's pretty cool. These are just some other uh, print-based resources, some other publications that are all really fantastic. Uh, Bern Levendreen has a couple of resources. This is his newest. Uh, it's pretty great. Photographs of the past. Of course, Riley's Care and ID uh, is a must-have. And in the dark room uh, was published by the National Gallery of Art, and it's intended to be a layman's guide. Uh, but it's, I, I think it's pretty good, too. Okay. Environment can lead to mechanical, chemical, and biological time. It's a mental monitoring program to document and track the preservation quality of your storage facility. The data collected to assess the quality of your preservation um, environment, or so use the data that you collect uh, to achieve your preservation environment. It will help you know if you're at risk for mechanical, chemical, chemical, biological decay. Like, important to know the conditions of your environment or environment um, so you can begin to improve them. Exhibition um, spaces, uh, you can use data loggers. Uh, that's just sort of one of the many ways. If you have data loggers, that's fantastic. Make sure they're calibrated and working properly. That's really important. Um, if not, it's important to have some. Um, this institute has a consultation service that helps institutions set up a monitoring program. We'll help you determine how many loggers you need, where to put them. Our logger is the PEM2, and there's um, a software called eClimate Notebook that goes with it. That's really great. And it, and it, it takes data and it tells you when you're at risk for kind of deterioration. 
and grants available to um, to the establishing a monitoring program, you'll find that uh, your storage environment is uh, likely ideal. Uh, you may find also or also already are aware that maintaining a preservation environment is costly. So a holistic look at the needs of your collection and the performance of your institution's mechanical system can save energy costs and better achieve a preservation environment. Often since the operation of the existing mechanical systems can be made for low or no expense. Uh, we also have a consultation service available that's been detailed analysis of data from your storage area and your mechanical system with the goal of improving environment conditions for collections and saving money. Again, there's available for this. So just if you know if you can opt optimize your HVAC system, your will be better and, and you'll save money in the long run. Control within your storage environment is also important. There's two types of pollutants, gaseous and particulate. Uh, several tests available to uh, be administered to better understand what pollutants are present in your storage space. Again, the idea you understanding what's, what the problem is before you take the steps to begin to fix it. Um, and here in the slide, there's um, suggestions of how, of how to um, test as well as how to fix. These are just general recommendations. High or low temperature or RH have a much more significant impact on material preservation than sudden temporary spikes or short-term fluctuations. An evaluation of your mechanical system will help you stay within acceptable range for preservation. The operational settings be different depending on the season, your climate, construction of your particular building, and the preservation needs of your collection. There are some resources. The top link is a link to our consultation services. Um, there's also a link to this publication. That, that own here, the Sustainable Preservation Practices. There's the Northeast Document Center Preservation Leaflets. Those are really fantastic. I highly recommend those. Here are some grants. Uh, so I have mentioned a lot of grants. These are the grants to consider for, um, for our consulting services or any consulting services um, you might be interested in to kind of get, get you on the road to proper preservation. Environment. Next, we'll talk more about storage materials. Uh, I'd say uh, briefly, poor storage materials will lead to a host of chemical deterioration issues within your collection. Make sure that the materials you have have passed the photographic activity test. The photographic activity test is an international standard. It's a test we perform here at IPI. What happens is that the manufacturers of the housing materials materials to us and ask us to test them. Uh, we test them uh, to ensure that there's no reaction with photographic materials. It's a pass-fail test. Um, if there's any teeny bitsy reaction, it fails. Um, so um, it's a fairly simple test, but it's a really good test. And temperature humidity, and air filtration. It's have an integrated pest management program in place. It's important to maintain a high level of security. Most theft occurs within institutions by employees, believe it or not. Uh, also, uh, have an emergency preparedness plan and review it uh, regularly with your staff. That's all I have. I want to say a special thank you to COSA and to Gear for inviting me to speak. Um, thank you very much to my co-presenters, who you'll hear from in a minute. I especially want to thank all of you for participating, and thank you for all of the work you do in caring for our cultural heritage. Thank you, Alice. My name is... <laughs> thank you. My name is Jen Cruikshank, and I work at the Maryland State Archives. And I'll be discussing some of the improvements that we have made here 
photo storage. And at the end, there will be some more information because I too will be um, heading through this pretty fast. Again, here in 1998, as a person bench training to be a paper conservator. Next. Have control of the slides if you want to move your own slides oh, today. Sorry. <laughs> Are you control? There you go. I do. This is my office. To the left, you can see there um, behind the trees four level of stacks where our general photographic collections are stored. Behind and to the right, you can see part of our building that has our special collections storage, including our special collections photo storage, some office space, and the conservation lab. And out in front center, you can see the terraced roof line of our purpose-built building with windows providing natural light to the search room. I realized fairly early on that we have a pretty extensive photographic collection, both in type and in scope, um, but their collection, that collection and their preservation needs was rather served. So I began taking classes in the care of photographic collections, in one on recovery wet collections. There overlap in the kinds of photographs that we have, but as a standout, our general collections tend to have also things that are part of legal documents. They tend to be sold photographs tied together into a legal folder at the top with a metal clasp, as well as sometimes not very well. Our special collections tend to be things of a more variety, more cased photographs, sometimes things that have been on prolonged display, and often things that have suffered some water damage. I tend to think of photographs as the um, things pretty comfortable with. Most of us have some silver photographs that have been on prolonged display in our living room. They are, in fact, rather um, more meets the eye. And by number and by number of objects, probably most of our collections really are most representative of silver gelatin and color photographic images. Well, even just that silver gelatin photograph that we feel so comfortable about really has much more to it than we think of. And then with a, within a gelatin layer, there are clumps of silver particles, larger clumps in darker areas, and smaller clumps in light areas. Photo finishing techniques might have varied um, even beyond the paper of choice, which um, earlier in the 19, in the 1900s would have been um, quite extensive collection of possibilities. But once you've processed them, you could have changed the gloss by buying it up against a hot metal um, surface or some other things like toning or surface coatings. You could have swapped out one molecule for a different one to using thing, change the color for for whim, or change the preservation quality of it. Anyway, just some things that vary about the kind of photograph that we probably all feel most comfortable with. That said, there are definitely susceptibilities to these, including humidity and mechanical breakage. Classes that cause damage to our collections can have with things within our buildings. Uh, poor quality display materials, those are cases that we have had for a long time that might have plywood in them, as um, painting or game carpet can cause off gassing. I think also a cause of edge and cotton gloves should be worn. 
dust does abrasive, um, abrasive damage to the surface. What can happen is that touching the dust on the surface, we make micro abrasions, which can add even more chance for that gas to get in and start the process of damage. So you could, with very soft, clean, dry brush, dust off the surface if there was an awful lot of dust on your silver gel and photograph, but that would be about all you would want to do. The building, of course, protects from the rain from the sun, our access system, so the ability that we can make it work to protect our collections really can help prevent some of the and contraction that happens at a much greater rate if you leave something in your attic, if you leave something, of course, in your basement. Still, there's fluctuations that are happening within our buildings as much as we might try, just smaller. Um, Shell is helpful in protecting it physically. Wood shelving can be a cause of some of this, um, of some of the pollution. Box also help to protect physically. If you leave a data logger in a box item and you put another data logger right inside the box, you'll find that part of, besides removing some of the light and, and dust and from shelter, it, it also softens some of the fluctuation. You want to pay particular close attention to the suitability of anything that is right up against those photographs, both chemically and is it supportive. And back to the Maryland State Archives building, this is inside. Um, you're looking across the top of the search room. On the left, the, the second and third floor of SACS, where our general collections are housed. On the top right, right, you'll see that there's the photo photographic collection room. All mobile storage, but you notice that windows are masked on the right side. We'll talk a bit about this later. As mentioned, light damage definitely is an issue. Uh, even that silver gelatin photograph that we are most um, comfortable with is even when well processed, it is still susceptible to damage. Although it fares better than a lot of other kinds of photographs, you might notice. But the fact that it's been on your wall for a long time, I'm, I mean, you may not have a photograph that's been on your wall for a long time. Maybe that's just me. Has lost some of the palest gray areas. This that area, the silver clumps make up that area, tends to dissipate, and you lose that information layer. We've used various types of indicators to see what kind of weight issues we have at the Maryland State Archives. We've used all of these except perhaps the blue wool standard, which is very good. We just have not um, made enough use of it. We do have a handheld light meter, which is great for spot checking a particular place at a particular moment in time. And have, over the last decade, we have had multiple kinds of data loggers, mostly for our RH and temperature, and these have documented our problems and been working to fix those HVAC issues. And but a few of those do we have that have the light meat in them. And we have those in places where you can use that for important ongoing use of loan agreements. See pink is a method that we have used extensively. It does have the advantage that it's uh, and easy to use, and we employed this mainly in 2006, and some of them we've actually left up. 
red coloring is fairly fugitive, and if you take a bunch of filter paper and color it all at the same time, then cover up a section with an opaque paper and mark fully where you've put it and when. Later, you can pull aside the opaque paper and see the fading. Within the photo room, um, these are two pictures of just this method. We had imported them in 2006, and this picture, both of them are from early this month. The right is from the glass wall that is common with the search room. It is behind the Tybeck curtain that we installed after we found out that, yes, we do have quite a problem in that room. It out to white, and it had done that several years ago, but we've left it up. The west is a lighter pink than is under the opaque section, but not quite the color change of the one that has been in the window. Again, this is in 2006. So. Of other kinds of fixes that you can do for light levels. Um, PV coatings within your windows is helpful. Um, those do lose effectiveness over time. You put UV covers with UV covers within the covers of your light fixtures. Putting them around the bulbs is not quite as good because sometimes the changed bulbs tend to um, tend to walk away with the filter on them. Filters um, in historic buildings can be closed, and it is certainly a historically accurate thing to do. Motion sensors have been employed in our building um, sometime after we put up the Tyvek curtain, and that can, um, can be helpful and for exhibits as well as for um, general room areas. Something on after looking for more information about the CCI Pink, on the CCI website, they have a article where they've used corrugated plastic, much like a honeycomb filter um, in a way that only provides light. Um, but it can also be uh, good for um, helping the environment. Case graphs. This is another item that we are now going into what we've done to rehouse objects. This is an example of a case object that might have come into the archives, and we have put an unbuffered paper around it in a fashion in a suitable box. What I want you to notice is the fancy surround outer layer. Below there are several other layers of the photograph. Just below that is top surface of a, um, of a layer that the photographer would have installed which excludes the air from the photographic package. This is really important because it excludes the motion. And if you ever have a photo where this has been breached, you should see photographic conservator soon because that will start to degrade the image soon. This is, of course, a narrow type, but it also has more different kinds of material around it. So not only do we have the metal elements, the glass, now here too we've added wood, we've added velvet, just more different kinds of things that have susceptibilities. This is an example of a mass rehousing that was done in the 1990s on a high quality board at the top, which is very good for the 99% of the panic photos that were rehoused this way that are of a, a small size. Fortunately, this one, um, nobody stopped to think about a different solution and it is hanging out on either side, although it does say fragile on the bottom. This 
a really good example of something where mechanical damage seems um, all certainly destined to happen if something else isn't done. And this is the kind of thing that we would prioritize to fix um, very high up on our, our level of to-do list. Not too long ago, this is a incoming group of two photos in one collection. They are both panoramic, but not on board like the last one. What we have as a solution here is to make one board, um, one piece um, outer filter out of corrugated plastic hinged at the top. We've attached two custom-made four-flap enclosures out a unfurred rag folder stock. We've made them the right size for the individual objects, plus a little bit of room for expansion and contraction. Both these folders have then been added to their part of the outer enclosure using a 3M415 tape, which you may have on hand, actually. It is used by institutions that do not have of encapsulators to make my enclosures. You use a piece of cotton tape next to it to make sure that your object does not fall into the well. This close-up of a sink, a sink mat. Sink mats and sink mats are another way to provide rigidity to an enclosure for an object that might be on a brittle board. Many of our photographs are on a board that is original to the object, however brittle. And this, if kept in a folder by itself, would be um, certainly subject to mechanical damage. This two pieces of leg unbuffered mat board hinge together at the top, and there are spacers that have been added with a little bit of room around the edge so that it adds rigidity and it is pretty warming to the shape around the photograph. Under it, there is a scrap of mylar, which can help you to pull the object out of the enclosure rather than coming with your finger and chipping the board. This is an example of a group of glass plate negatives. We're housing them using a ready-made system, but we're augmenting it ever slightly to benefit this collection. This is a group of photographs that we want to keep together. Uh, some of them are in fairly good shape. A lot of them have some loss of emulsion at the edge, or the emulsion is beginning to curl up at the edge. And this one that's pictured at the le left is negative, where the corner was broken off and lost before being given to the archive. Within the four-flap enclosure that is designed for a glass plate negative, we have put with 14 tape a piece of one-ply rag mat board and buffered in the bottom and then made a compensation for the corner, marking the envelope in such a way that it compels you to put this long side down or break upwards within the box, it can go with the rest of its collection. So we have a slight filling of emulsion just at the very edge. We have put a one-ply piece of mat board into the bottom of that fourth enclosure with just a little bit of room. So when you pick up the photograph, when you pick up the negative, you don't necessarily break off that little bit of emulsion. Buffered or buffered rag material, buffered material? That's a really good question. Certain photographs, which are in fact probably a great percentage of collections, fine with either. Uh, but a lot of different kinds of photographic collections and indeed some other collections would benefit from being put with unbuffered materials. Albion color and early photographs are some examples that really should be in offered enclosures. 
well, easier to, it can be harder to identify what kind of photograph you have than you might think due to all the different kinds of photographs that there have been when you really start to look. And some of them have been colored in different ways to look like other kinds. Uh, sometimes a damaged photograph can look a color throwing off how you perceive what it is. So um, if you're not sure, I would opt to use unbuffered material. That you can also use those materials that you have that are unbuffered to rehab your other collections, such as parchment or wool or silk. Um, use an unbuffered tissue for out textiles. Use a, um, a harder product, such as a folder stock or a map board for parchments and their protein. We have improved our photographic storage in several kinds of ways, but we've been doing it slowly over time, prioritizing things that really have to be done first, such as phasing out really the worst boxes um, and, and rehabbing things that are in imminent danger, such as that photograph with um, two inches of photograph uh, out of either side of a board. Um, Income items that need to be rehoused, especially in the special collections, tend to be rehoused as they come in. Another thing we've done is to help staff with handling, um, troubleshooting within scanning, um, just get staff on board about how they are handling affects the preservation and ongoing existence of those objects. It is much easier to tell somebody how to pick up a photo on a brittle board than to then figure out how do you reattach or how to not, not lose a broken off corner. We have, in, we have improved a lot of different techniques. And indeed, over the last couple of decades, some of the things um, that seemed like Acceptable techniques have been thought less high of. Um, techniques and sometimes uh, newer kinds of materials can supplant old ones. What doesn't change is what is the susceptibility of different collections. A better idea of what can be used to do several kinds of duties. Um, when we left over boards from um, from things that are a rag and, and microchamber, we put them into the bottom of our enclosures for um, for put on display. We we reuse material in a way that is effective and um, with what is right up against the we pay especially close attention to what is most intimately in contact. As this touches, um, can cause mechanical damage and certainly can cause physical damage. We phased in things that are not helpful, um, phased in things that are more helpful, lignum-free boxes. Um, we've been using unbuffered shoe, um, graded what kind of we use if we do still have to use the glue. The boxes that we use, we tend now to use the ones that have a metal enclose, a metal closure, or come and assemble themselves by locking into place. We're using out boxes that have been put together with glue and um, fabric on the outside. you start to change and improve things? Well, unfortunately, looking at how olders have caused damage is a great way to see what you can do better. Um, but start with looking at what you have and 
might be a good solution for a specific type of object. If you find that um, that you have something that you have questions about, I would ask as many people as you can. I think you'll fit a few. You talk to your professionals, vendors, conservators, other professionals, you'll find that probably other people have addressed similar enough concerns and might have great or novel answers. It's also important to look at um, what are your capabilities. Do you have handy people and a large enough space to do anything very long or just to do um, the small of customization of a box. Are you needing to have one box or 300? A thing you can do with just one object rehang can be done more efficiently in a group. Um, the least possible amount of changes to an off-the-shelf product can be the most efficient. If you find that you're going to make an enclosure or make something different, I would say look for what has been um, look at damage or chemical damage of enclosures from a sim similar object first and see if you can learn something from that. Um, then at what you might do for a new project. Um, when you look, write down what you did, how you assembled it, how long it took, knowing that if you did it again, you'd be faster. And you probably will learn something from it and would do it differently again in the future. Also important is to look at how it really fares within a year and if it's something novel, leave information on it. Um, do you close this flap first? That would be helpful. Summary preparedness is another place in which it's important to think about your collections. But it's important to think also about those photographic collections that you might not think of. Um, do you have bound photographs within your general collection? Those um, necessitate being unbound before being dried. Um, you leave them in a stack, they will weld together. Obviously damaged photos can have issues. Um, photographs can have other elements to them um, in finishing that more is lost than the information of what, what is depicted than just the itself. Um, and can some getting help with addressing these photographic collections in your emergency preparedness plan because it is not really the same in timeline or for what you can freeze or in many ways from what is in your uh, your agenda in paper recovery. Thank you. And there are some other um, resources, some that I've um, talked about a little bit, a little more information. Thank you so much, and I'm going to do the ball. Thank you very much, Jen. I assume everyone can hear you now. My name is Baker. I'm a product manager at Gaylord Brothers. Here is really just to um, cap off what Alice and Jen have done. They're experts in what they do. I just um, I deal mostly with the materials and the supplies, and I talk a little bit about the types of materials and supplies everyone can get to um, make best use of your budget and time. And I also want to say before we start is that. Product manager, and I'm not a salesperson. So while I understand um, people supply products other places, I'd like, to, I'd love it, of course, if you got them from Gaylord Brothers. It's part of what I do. But I do want to inform people of the best things that they can find in the best way possible. Oh, so of course, by saying these are Gaylord Brothers here, we were founded 
in the 1800s uh, by two brothers, Glenn Gaylord. Um, we're still around and focusing very much on our Bible products lately. Uh, some of the things that we do, just a, uh, just a scattering handful of the things that we do. We have a lot, lot of different things. Bottom left-hand corner there is some corrugated polypropylene, which Ben had mentioned in the presentation. And we're talking about environmental monitoring, which Alan mentioned extensively. Um, this can get be a very expensive part of what you're doing when you're managing your photographic collections. And I think the best things that you can do in area is to look at the needs, how big your space is, the monitoring you need to do, and how you want to evaluate your data. And then consider your needs and what your ideal situation would be. You also have to look at what your budget is and how you're going to reconcile those two. And in a perfect world, we'd be able to perfectly and consistently monitor all areas of the environment. That can become expensive, unfortunately. Uh, we at JPA sell a number of data loggers. We do sell them too, which is just a wonderful device. We also sell some, um, um, so a little bit on the lower cost end and work slightly differently. And there's also some very expensive products that have different features. So things to assess what needs you have there as far as data loggers go. And first, we strongly encourage people to look for grants when they're looking for data loggers. There are options out there for grants, and we do see that all the time. We also encourage people to do when they're looking at monitoring their environment is to consider consider whether or not they need a data logger or a thermal hygrometer would meet their needs. The difference there is a data logger logs the data for you and sometimes actually sends it to some sort of um, software that, that takes care of that in some way. Or a thermal hygrometer just presents it to you. So you would have to go around and, and look at data and pick it up yourself. But there is that it's a significantly more affordable device. It involves a little work for you, but if it can fit in your budget, that might be a good option. One part of logging or seeing how your, your environment is, you have to remember to maintain it. Um, great job talking about how our does this. A lot of institutions really struggle with this. It's hard to meet things in the ideal situation. Um, if necessary, if you can't get the wonderful HVAC system, that is the best option. Um, you can use desiccants, which really takes to go as far as you need, but it is an option. And um, I would say also look into things like dehumidifiers. It may get you as far as might be ideal, but if you're budget, it does get you a distance. Also, forget to monitor light. That blue picture in the bottom of the slide here is the uh, textile fading cards, the blue cards that uh, are to pink circles that showed us. They have different levels of huge dyes dyed to wool. You can cover up half of those cards or use two different cards and compare how much they fade. In the same way, it's just the level of they have eight different levels of fugitive size. So you would use. Let's go into the specifications and different types of things that we'd be looking at. Your materials, what would you want to pick up? The first thing you need to decide is you paper or plastic. The big plastic is you can see through it. I tell a lot of people who have very small collections and they want to look at a lot. The issue with that is that if they're going to be looking at it a lot, they might want to have plastic they can see through. Uh, use if you have a heat sealer, it protects the item from moisture and from pollutants. And for to be more expensive. On the other hand, you've got paper with light because it's opaque. Paper prevents accumulation of moisture. Usually, unless 
for it were to get wet in some reason, maybe you had a leak and the bill is just going to get soaked. It's expensive. However, if you're handling these items a lot, you will remove them from the paper every time you want to see them. It's the biggest trade off right there, but worth considering. When we're looking at paper materials, what do we want to look for? Clearly, I think a lot of these things are things that everyone I'm talking to already knows. I like to really go over it again and again, just so that way everyone is really well informed about what job for. We pretty much always meet these standards. We have a couple of things that we sell specifically intended for transportation. I sometimes places that mark things as archival, but are really sort of hobbyist stores. Um, sometimes fail in this regard, so I do like people to be informed. The pay course should be acid free, or the pH minimum of 7.0, higher than that. Material lignin free, lignin components of plants and trees. If it's not removed, it's going to over time react with light and heat and become acidic. So you, you do see this in, in all the archival materials that it has. Wood pulp, it's not so much of a problem, cotton fiber. For it is more expensive. It's a quality though. So it's a little bit of a better quality. I do see a question over there in chat. I think I'll address that at the end. Being used shouldn't discolor, deteriorate, anything like that. As um, Jen pointed out, it's generally better to avoid adhesives when possible. I like to use it in boxes that don't need them at all, but necessary. Be very, very careful about your adhesives. The issue with paper is buffers unbuffered. Buffer is a outline reserve added to it. It's added in the actual creation of the paper slurry when it's still wet. 2 to 3% calcium or magnesium carbonate, ours is a calcium carbonate. By um, is that the ISO, the International Standards Organization, that all photographs are safe to go in buffers. However, I defer to the experts on this and always go with whatever somebody is comfortable with. I know lots of people prefer to put their photographs in unbuffered materials, and I think that's great. And if you're sure what something is, it's definitely better to use unbuffered. Also, it has if it if ever storing has animal proteins or is just proteaceous in general, it should go in unbuffered. Blueprints, Diazo reproductions, and types of um, those also go in unbuffered materials. Plastics. We look for plastics that are inert and stable, that they don't react to things. Asking for the type of plastic or the, the, the quality of plastic, you'll probably see mill a lot of places, and that refers to the thickness. Uh, so, looking for a stronger plastic, look for a thicker mill. This that I have up talks about the three types of plastic that are considered acceptable for long use in archives. The gaster, which is probably the one you're going to see used the most. This is this, it's the clearest, it has that crispy feel. You might call it mylar or melanin. It's in its kernels can actually be quite supportive. It feels for encapsulation. Uh, it can be a little more expensive. I find sometimes that people who are on a complete shoestring budget find a little off-putting, and I am sympathetic to that problem. Polyester can get a little bit spendy. A little less clear. It has a softer feel. You see album pages made out of this a lot with photo albums. Still perfectly safe. Polyester is a little cloudy. It's also still perfectly safe. Probably the cheapest option. PAT briefly, because Alice did mention this, 
the test done to evaluate whether or not something is safe for photo storage. This is something you should look for whenever possible, whenever you're buying your materials. I'll say that, um, again, I think at many vendors, if things not marked as having passed the PH, there's a very good possibility that it hasn't been tested. No, it's failed, but it hasn't been tested. And feel free to follow up on that. We will answer questions about that at Gaylord if you do need, do need that. And sometimes the answer is simply, we have not tested that, or we haven't tested all the components that we have used to make that product. Um, unfortunately, as with anything, there are some expense involved in that and time. And then to IPI's descriptive process was very interesting, and I'd encourage everyone to read it. This is a few of things that are available to you if you purchase it. Um, Alice, I'm sorry, Jen did a great job of describing some materials that she used um, and made in a lot of cases to, to put things in, but there's some ideas. Uh, envelopes and sleeves, both in paper and in polyester or polyethylene or polypropylene. These are what they sound. For flesh, and they go around the item. Usually great for thicker things. Some they have scores on the sides. For a little bit better for documents or for very large things. So they go neatly into boxes. And so I, I like that as an option. You have collection or documentation with it or, or something that needs to go into a box. The point out in the bottom right hand corner there is that um, specialty boxes are really an option. In a collection of something case, glass plate negative, that box is lined with Valara foam to put the negatives and keep them safe. We do offer a good number of things like that. We also offer a cold storage kit, which has become a big thing that we institutions do. Um, so they're available to you if you don't even need a large volume. And again, I encourage everyone to not be limited in the vendors that they use. The other to make sure that you look at is things like interleaving paper, which if you need photos together without putting them in an individual enclosure, you can interleave the paper in between the photos. <coughs> and I really think that you've heard already, but make sure that you handle everything with care. To um, wear the appropriate gloves and keep work area clean. I love how people to label things, hard because even in my own workplace, whenever I'm, I'm not even dealing with artifacts, you don't label it, I have no idea what's going on anymore. So label everything. Say is that when you're on a budget, consider the needs of the item. Not everything needs to be stored with the same love. Things will deserve and need a better level of treatment than other things. And that can really help you with the needs of your collection within a budget. Okay. Uh, everything can be useful to you. Make some raw materials to make your own boxes. Save all the scraps. Uh, bookmarks or labels or pins to some other enclosure. If you get Folders from Gaylord, the box that the file folders come in is now of archivally safe material. So you'll find that many things are useful to you. That's and I think we are moving into questions now. I will pass uh, back over to Anne, who I think is facilitating this. Bit. And our speakers, uh, we have a couple of questions already uh, in the chat box uh, from Susan Lugo. So why don't we start there? And, uh, her first question was about uh, different applications for latex, free gloves, and cotton gloves. And that question is uh, posed to all the presenters. So we'll take off that discussion, gloves. This is okay. Alice. Um, often, often it's a, just a matter of preference. Um, I like uh, nitrile gloves, so latex or nitrile. Um, 
the latex allergies. So um, some nitrile gloves are nice because they offer you uh, more of a grip. If you're dealing things like, for example, glass plate negatives, you don't really want slippery cotton gloves. Um, I also find with cotton gloves, it makes me feel like I have clown hands. You know, like, you, you just can't quite, like, use your hands the way you want to use them. Um, but at the same time, you know, they're softer. Uh, I think another is that they also leave little uh, fabric, a little bits. Um, yeah, I guess in general, it sounds like I prefer nitrile, but again, it's just a matter of preference. Nitrile you throw away, cotton you wash and reuse. So cotton is by far the most economical. Uh, but I, I think I think most collections have both. Uh, just in that's yeah. And then, um, uh, Jane too in in her written mm -hmm. response uh, that uh, Mary offers both to, in their search room. Um, for, so that, that's that's really great. From a perspective, we've seen a dramatic increase in interest in nitrile gloves. So it does seem to be a um, a change in what people are doing. Is that no, I'm going to say that it, there does seem to be an increased move towards using nitrile gloves. Side of nitrile, besides that you have to throw them away, is that uh, you get what I call swamp hand. <laughs> uh, so if you wear them for a long, long period of time, your hands get like really being gross. But they're inside the gloves, so I guess. You know. <laughs> it's just like, Second question has to do with uh, moving uh, materials uh, from storage into the research room for um, or to a workroom, uh, and and how you mitigate the movement of materials from environment to another. Who'd like to take that? I guess again, um, it's um, it's about when you're from cold storage, like 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 a freezer space, into um, what human human comfort level for researchers. Uh, you you need to slowly step it up and allow uh, the materials to acclimate. Uh, so what you, what you would do is you take it from your your sort of Free space your cold space into a cool space, and let it sit for at least 24 hours before you get into uh, uh, that's you know sort of 70 degrees and comfortable for people. Because what will happen is if you move it right from the freezer to 70 degrees, if you'll hit dew point and and um, condensation will form on your cotton, and that's that you don't want that because condensation in the water will will, will be very active. But if you're doing a uh, from cool situation, like um, 60 degrees to 70 degrees, uh, you know, your sort of standard 60-40 uh, storage uh, into like a sort of 70 degree space, you don't have to worry about it as much. You probably won't have to do point. But... So that kind of requires uh, uh, um, to maybe don't have some kind of a protocol or um, for getting materials for use in the research room to maybe think about putting in place a protocol of some sort. Yeah. Anything that's, that's going from um, from a very environment to be needs to be slowly climatized before bring to the like a like a study room. Thank you for that. That ends at the moment. Why don't we continue to move along? I'm I'm also mindful of our time, and we have a few COSA um, announcements to make as well here at the end. But uh, before I do that, I want to re folks that as after you exit the webinar, you're going to automatically be taken to an online webinar evaluation. And we hope that you'll spend a couple of minutes completing the survey there. Uh, those webinar evaluations really help us to plan future webinars. So your input is very valuable to us. 
just a few things that are coming uh, coming down the pike here at COSA. Our annual meeting is uh, um, this summer, August 13 through 16, Washington, D.C., and hopefully we're going to see many of you there. Uh, complete, uh, really, uh, as complete as, as possible, a schedule of COSA events. Uh, during the meeting is available for you online at our website. Uh, you'll see a tab for annual meeting and, and go there and you can get the schedule. And that's going to be updated on a regular basis as, as we continue to populate that with, with activities and information. And just before the annual meeting gets formally underway, our, um, our portal workshop um, will be taking place uh, in Washington. There is uh, scholarship funding available. Uh, or travel funding for people to attend that workshop. That's going to be an opportunity for folks to get an in-depth orientation to the new electronic records portal that's being developed uh, right now, as a matter of fact, um, with funding from the NHPRC. Um, the PERTS will, will be packed with all kinds of great resources and tools about electronic records management and digital preservation. We're also uh, looking for uh, suggestions for uh, member our uh, topics for 2015. Uh, our program committee is going to be tackling the 2015 schedule uh, in over the summer months, and so we would love to hear from you if you've got topics that you want to hear about or topics that you'd like to present on. So let us know. And finally, the program committee uh, is. Uh, and to hear from you if you'd like to, to join in with it to uh, help create programming for COSA. Um, Ian's question about a means to broadcast the webinar uh, by the PERTS portal workshop, and Brian answered that at the moment, but <laughs> we'll, we'll find out for you and, and let you know. So here's a scene of what's on the uh, calendar of events coming up, beginning with uh, PERTS Portal Workshop funding applications, which are due at the end of this month. So you don't have a lot of time, but we encourage you to uh, apply if you want to come to that workshop in Washington this August. It um, will be on the 12th and 13th, just prior to the formal startup of the joint annual meeting on the 13th through 16th. Um, our second series, Advanced Electronic Records, Institute will be taking place in October in Salt Lake, and the Best Practices Exchange is coming up in November in, in Alabama. Our web is really full. Um, both the Siri project, which is the State Electronic Records Initiative project, has monthly webinars, and uh, the member webinars that COSA produces are also month monthly. You can count on at least two webinars per month that you can take advantage of. And coming up next month, Siri will be doing a webinar on electronic records inventory, and, and the COSA member webinar is going to be looking at succession planning in state archives. We have an opportunity here to uh, thank our corporate uh, sponsored federal funders. Each year, COSA's corporate partnerships provide critical funding for many of our membership activities and events. And we are especially grateful to Lord today for their assistance with the development and presentation of today's webinar. And like Media Preserve as our newest corporate sponsor who will be supporting our annual meeting. You'll have our corporate sponsors featured here. And some of COSA's program initiatives is also generally provided, generously provided by grants from the NHPRC and IMLS. Sign up, tweet with us. Um, we're at State Archivists here, and we'd love to have you join us there. And here's how to stay informed uh, our website, the Recenter, our blog, Facebook. So, uh, uh, Becky Juleson has weighed in here to uh, Brian's uh, question about possibly. Um, producing the portal workshop uh, via webinar, and, and she said that um, we're actually looking into trying to do that. So stay tuned on that score. Uh, we've reached our, the end of our time. It's 4.15 Eastern time. I have to 
once again thank Alice, Jen, and Amanda uh, for spending with us this afternoon, and and to thank Gail Brothers for helping us put this webinar together. I think it's been really great, and I hope all of you who've participated have found it to be useful as well. Thank you once again, and we hope to see you next month. Take care, everybody.